Welcome to this course in RNAV Approaches. You will be happy to know that this course is tailored to the Airbus 320 family aircraft. The course contains six individual modules. First, we will think about RNAV as a concept. Second, we will analyze how RNAV approaches are designed. Third, we will look at some aircraft features that are specific to RNAV. Fourth, we will examine how to fly an RNAV in some detail. Fifth, we will review highlights from procedures. And number six and last, we will look at some videos from actual RNAV approaches. Now, just a few words on how to get the most out of this course. It is designed to build up knowledge in a progressive way. It is presented as a video on a single timeline. So do feel free to play, pause, go back and forth as you see fit. Use your operating manuals as you go along. You probably think that you can find everything you need when you need it, but do not underestimate the complexity of finding all relevant information. Think, switch on your brain, think about what you have experienced. Remember, any approach can be executed in a number of ways. Where could you improve? And last, enjoy. We have tried to make this interesting, stimulating and realistic. Now, before we begin, let's take a moment to think about RNAV approaches. What are they? What do we know? Well, they are non-precision approaches. They are flown in the final approach mode. And yes, it's much like uh, flying on ILS, or is it? Which makes them easy. Easy, yes. Easy if you know what you're doing. Area navigation is a concept that has been used for a long time in aviation. Now, back in the good old days, navigation was primarily the ground-based equipment. Navigating meant flying between beacons en route to your destination. This meant that a signal from ground navigation was essential. Through technical advances, aircraft equipment could use signals from ground-based navigation to create pseudo-waypoints. Now this system still relied on ground navigation, but in later days also uses aircraft inertia system and signal from satellites. This has created tremendous benefits in route optimization with associated time and fuel savings. And this is the basic concept of area navigation. Now let's take a step back and look at the bigger picture. 
introducing the term performance-based navigation. In its basic form, it represents two concepts. First is the area navigation, which we have just discussed, or RNAV. And second is the required navigation performance, RMP. In your career, you will come across the two quite often, but what is the difference? Well, one of them requires onboard performance monitoring and alerting. And that is the RNP. By definition, RNAV does not require such a feature, but the aircraft may still be able. Bottom line is that both systems are inherently similar. Both RNAV and RMP are defined in various terms, such as accuracy, integrity, continuity, and functionality. Probably the most common you will see is accuracy. It is usually defined as a number or a fraction. In this example, RMP5 signifies that the aircraft system is capable of maintaining track within 5 nautical miles at least 95% of the time. Although the concept of performance-based navigation may seem simple enough, the industry has gone completely off rails in allocating names to different type of area navigation. It is like a world championship in abbreviations. Europe uses certain acronyms, the USA is something slightly different, and so on. If you want to make sense of it, you will be left with a headache and possibly more questions than answers. This course will not intend to clarify all of this. Our focus is the RNAV GPS approach with LNAV VNAV minima. And now for the small print. Please note that this course is for academic research only. Your company manuals and SOPs always prevail. Also note that each aircraft may have differences, so check your operating manuals and remember to cross-reference with correct serial number. In this module, we're going to examine some typical RNAV approaches and derive what makes them special or different. A good starting point is analyzing a typical RNAV approach and to abstract some key elements. We will look specifically into special notification, the lateral profile, the height to distance, the vertical profile, and the operating minima.
some Arnav approaches are cleverly designed and assume a continuous descent flight angle from a final approach fix. Now that is pretty clever. Other Arnav approaches, and quite a lot of them, are designed in an old-fashioned way, with a continuous descent from a low-level final approach fix, preceded with a prior drop and drag segment. In this case, a continuous descent from a higher level would mean just over 3,000 feet at point kilofox in tier 10. So the question is, how do you want to fly an Arnav approach? Do you want to do it drop and drag style? Or do you want a continuous descent from a higher platform? And if so, where is this platform? You will see a lot of different... Same applies to the design of the lateral profile. They're not always great. Some require very sharp turns of 90 degrees or even more. Other profiles are more gentle and allow for a smooth turn into the final approach course. And some profiles are designed for the aircraft to be radar vectored into the final approach. Again, let's ask ourselves, how do you want to fly an aggressive Arnav approach. Normally, during a non-precision approach, you monitor the profile by comparing height to distance. On an Arnav approach chart, there is such a scale. It uses distance from the runway threshold. Note, in this case, the scale does not start from the final descent point, but only from 1400 feet. That gives you little margin to confirm your profile. Arnav approaches are limited in low temperatures. On the approach charts, you can see stipulations that approaches are not available below certain temperatures. The reason is that in relatively cold air, the flight path angle is more shallow than in warmer air. The aircraft systems are unable to automatically detect this and correct. Hence this limitation, usually between 10 and 20 degrees Celsius. Operating minima for Arnav approaches are defined as LNAV and VNAV. VNAV stands for Vertical Navigation and refers to the aircraft's ability to automatically fly the vertical profile. 
LNAV is a lateral navigation and is the aircraft's ability to track the lateral profile. If the aircraft is both VNAV and LNAV capable, you use that operating minima. Time to climb on board the aircraft. In this module, we will look into different features of some aircraft systems and abstract items that have special relevance to RNAV approaches. In fact, most of it has relevance to other categories of non-precision approaches that might be useful to you. Now, before we begin this module, there's a message that needs repeating. If you have not opened up your manuals yet, go ahead and do so. Never underestimate how difficult it can be to find certain information, especially if the information is scattered all over the place, as it is with RNAV approaches. Let's start with a document not often used, the Aircraft Flight Manual. It provides some valuable information on the subject. First notice that a limitation and a condition for Arno approaches is GPS primary. After all, it is based on satellite navigation. Second, notice that it compares various RMP and Arno values Quite difficult to understand. A third interesting thing is a table that illustrates the demonstrated accuracy comparing flight modes and phases of flight with GPS primary. Note that autopilot and flight director off is not permitted. Makes sense. This is not a raw data exercise. The aircraft is incredibly capable of knowing its current and correct position. It uses a mixed input from the IRSs radio beacons and the GPS. This data is combined in a single aircraft position. It produces a constant evaluation of the position accuracy, which is presented on the MCTU progress page. On the bottom left, you can see the required performance. And to the bottom right, the estimation. If the required is higher than estimated, accuracy is high. If required is lower than estimated, accuracy is low.
the required field uses default settings. These default settings depend on the phase of flight and appear automatically. Or they can be manually selected. Now, since ARLOV approaches are only allowed with GPS primary, the GPS becomes of special interest. The important thing is that if GPS is primary, accuracy should always be high. If there's a system failure and you lose the GPS, accuracy may become low and the GPS primary indication is replaced with nav accuracy downgrade on both MCTU and navigation display. Honeywell equipment has special GPS coverage function in the MCTU. On the progress page, you press the predictive GPS. You will be presented with a prediction for your destination by default. The ETA is based on your current flight plan. It will predict plus or minus 15 minutes. You can also manually select a waypoint or a destination for example, an alternate for the same prediction. Yankee means positive coverage, November is negative coverage. Remember from a previous module that approach plate has height versus distance for profile monitoring based on the runway threshold? On the MCTU progress page, you can insert the runway threshold and it will provide bearing and distance with a continuous update. Few things are as important as knowing your FMA. Describing FMA functions is a bit tricky due to the many variations available. Let's look at a typical FMA sequence for an approach in, in final approach mode. When you press the approach push button, final is armed and blue in the vertical mode and approach nav in the lateral mode. Once you're on the inbound course, approach nav is active and green in the lateral mode. Once you've entered the final descent point and on the inbound course, final approach is active and green. Remember, this is just an example. Other versions are available.
once the approach phase is activated, vertical and, if installed, lateral deviation scales are visible on the primary flight display. The vertical deviation ranges from 200 feet above profile to 200 feet below. The lateral deviation is 0 0.2 nautical miles either side. Lateral deviation can also be observed on the navigation display. Understanding the vertical deviation can be somewhat of a challenge. Our mental model is so accustomed to the glide slope indication, we understand immediately if we are above or below the glide slope by looking at the indication. Normally, we fly into the glide slope from below and observe as the glide slope comes alive. Well, the vertical deviation scale doesn't quite work like that. It takes into account the track miles, the current altitude, and any restriction, and assesses whether the aircraft is on profile or not. This means that the vertical deviation can be zero long before you enter the final descent point. So just keep in mind, vertical deviation scale. As we know from a previous chapter, the vertical deviation can be zero long before you enter the final descent point. The challenge when flying in final approach mode is knowing when final descent starts. Is it on the final approach fix? Or is it somewhere else? Well, it can be, but not necessarily. In this type of approach, the aircraft designs its own profile, and at some point, it starts a final approach at a point referred to as final descent point. This is indicated on the navigation display as a blue arrow and is visible when approach mode is armed. Each approach can contain a number of level of descent points and altitude restrictions. The arrows are of different shapes and colors. This can really challenge your mental model and understanding of the profile. A common misconception is that the MCDU will create a profile that corresponds to the published profile, and that based on that, you will see indications on the navigation display that look the same. This may not be true. The aircraft creates its own profile based on the one in the MCTU and also on the current progress. It will also recalculate for variations. However, the last blue arrow you see on your navigation display should represent final descent point.
Now, I know you know this, but just in case, to arm the approach, you simply press the approach push button. Just remember not to press the landing system push button, as it does not apply. In fact, if you do, the vertical deviation scale will flash as a reminder. Different type of performance-based approaches required different type of minimum equipment. In the FCOM, you can find a list of minimum equipment required for ARNO approaches, like this example. The technical log and MEL may have valuable information concerning ARNAV capability. In this example, the MEL specifically refers to ARNAV operations. Be extra vigilant if you know or suspect an ARNAV approach is imminent and check your documentation. The title of this module 4 is How to Fly. Well, that's obvious. You just press the Approach Push button and the aircraft will take care of the rest. And it probably will. But in real life, you will discover that flying a non-precision approach in the final approach mode can be a bit more complicated. In fact, life will throw you a lot of different scenarios that need to be considered. You see, no approach is ever flown exactly the same way. You always need to manage a number of aspects, no matter the level of automation. This module will examine some aspects of the actual flying and the different options that always need to be considered. Now, let's start this with a bit of a CRM style discussion. One of the things that identify a skilled pilot is his ability to manage and prioritize workload. This is especially relevant for non-precision approaches. Now consider this. For every approach, there is a certain workload, i.e. things you need to do, decisions to make, and so on. At the same time, you need an overview of the whole process, i.e. situational awareness. Now the two elements are always present, both need to be addressed, but can you be 100% efficient in both? Not really. There is always a trade-off between the two. So how do we deal with this? Well, we mitigate between the two. And this process is a continuous cycle, every step of the way. Sometimes an easy one, sometimes hard. Now, consider this. You're in the final, final stages of an approach. How many tasks need to be completed? So actually, turns out to be quite a few. Now consider this.
you're faced with a demanding approach. How do you want to mitigate your workload and your situational awareness? Allow me to propose this. The more tasks you complete prior to your final descent, the more capacity you will have to monitor the final descent. A quick revision of the decelerated and early stabilized approach concepts will show us that a stabilized approach is flown in final speed and landing con configuration from the platform before the final approach begins. A decelerated approach is flown in such a way that final configuration and speed reduction take place during the final descent. Typically, precision ILS is flown in a decelerated fashion. So what to do for an Arnav approach? Well, the standard flying technique for flying an approach in final approach mode is to use the decelerated approach. However, under certain circumstances, crew may decide to fly an early stabilized approach. So what circumstances govern our choice of speed technique? Well, it could be a number of things. Maybe you want to reduce your workload and increase situational awareness as we discussed earlier. Maybe the weather is marginal and you want an early preparation. Or maybe you're descending from a low platform and want to ensure that you're stabilized at 1000 feet. There could be a number of reasons. It is purely circumstantial, but you need to make a choice. If you do decide an early stabilist approach, the procedure is to insert the approach speed at the final descent point in the MCTU flight plan page and then to be in landing configuration at that point. Now normally this works out quite nicely. The downside of this method is the high energy involved when flying level in full landing configuration and the shift of energy that takes place at the final descent point. There is an intermediate way if you want a more manageable, but still an early stabilized approach, consider this method. You approach the final descent point in configuration 2, gear down, speed around 180 knots. As you enter the descent point, you go to Managed, Approach Speed, and Landing Flaps. This method will ensure a smooth transition of energy, but also an early configuration.
So, how do you intend to fly this Arnav approach? Using autopilot? Flight director as well, maybe? Or maybe you just want to show off your stick skills and fly raw data. Well, as I'm sure you know, this is not a raw data procedure, so we can remove that from the list. When final approach mode is used for approach, the flight directors provide lateral and vertical guidance. The most obvious strategical choice is to use both autopilot and flight director. In good conditions, in good conditions, you may turn off the autopilot on final and use visual reference. If the minima is high above the airport elevation, or if the weather is marginal, it might be feasible to keep the autopilot engaged. If the profile is offset, then disconnecting no later than minima might be necessary to regain correct approach path. At minima, depending on your aircraft model, autopilot will either automatically disconnect with a mode reversion, or it will stay engaged. If it does so, remember, you're not autoland capable. Now for Arnav approaches, as with all other non-precision approaches, it's worthwhile revisiting a well-known concept referred to as continuous descent flight angle or CDFA. For reasons difficult to understand, a lot of approach profiles are still designed in the old-fashioned drop-and-drag style, with a series of step-downs before the final descent. But for a long time, the industry has adopted to the method of descending from a higher platform and a single continuous descent. Now there are benefits in flying at a continuous descent. First, it's a noise abatement. And second, you can avoid shifts in pitch and power, hence reducing energy and fuel consumption. Maybe the most important reason is for a more stable approach. Remember, the stabilization criteria dictates that in IMC conditions, you should be stable no later than 1000 feet above ground. If your platform is low, then your chances of being stable at 1,000 feet are diminished. From a higher platform, you will have a better margin to get yourself sorted out in time. Now take a look at this drop and drag profile and tell me. Do you want to follow the purpose procedure? Or do you want a higher platform for your final descent point? Remember, in managed mode, the aircraft creates a pseudo profile indicating the final descent as a blue arrow on the navigation display. A higher platform will give you better margins to be stable at 1000 feet in IMC conditions. So, are you a managed or selected type of guy or girl? Let's look at this concept further as it plays a big role in how we conduct our approaches. 
First of all, what do we manage or select? Well, three things. First, the speed. Second, the lateral mode. And third, the vertical mode. To begin this, let's look at a fully managed approach in a perfect world. In the lateral mode, we track the published procedure. In the vertical mode, we let the aircraft control the descent. In the speed mode, the aircraft will start to decelerate as it passes the deceleration point. It's pretty easy stuff. The box takes care of everything. Or does it? The box is quite good doing some things. Like creating a continuous descent, energy management, and keeping two restrictions. However, the box is limited in scope. It does not see or feel the outside world and all the variables that may affect. Quite often, we need to overwrite with selected. Let's examine this closer. Remember, in selected mode, we can manually manipulate the speed, the vertical, and the lateral modes. But why? Well, first of all, it may be due to ATC request. Or maybe you want to make your own modifications, maybe for better profiling. Let's begin with the lateral mode. If you're under radar vectors or doing your own navigation, and it does not correspond to the full published procedure, then how do you want to, or how do you intend to, intercept the final approach? Well, there are two main ways of doing this. The first way is to extend the center line from the final approach fix. If you're in heading mode and you arm the approach, approach nav will show us blue on your FMA. Once you enter the final approach track, approach nav will become active and green. The other way is to insert the final approach point into direct to in the MCDU. In this case, the aircraft will make a gradual turn towards that point. Now keep in mind that this curve may not look exactly the same as the rate of vector angle. Remember, if you don't clear the MCTU of unused points, guidance and predictions may not be correct. 
So, keep your box clean. If either you or ATC decide to deviate from the published procedures and keep the aircraft either high or low on profile, you need to revert to selected vertical mode, either open descent or vertical speed. In this case, the aircraft may not understand what's going on and vertical deviation may show too high or too low. When you get back on profile that the aircraft understands, the vertical deviation will find its way back. When you are in the approach mode, the aircraft will then calculate a final descent point with a blue arrow indicated on the navigation display. Of course, this is just a simple example. Many other variables are available. Speed control is a very important feature of any approach. Let's examine some interesting features. First, remember, for a managed speed, the aircraft system will create a speed profile, taking into account any restrictions. You can observe this on the flight plan page in the MCTU. Also, in managed speed and nav mode, the aircraft will decelerate first to green dot speed and then slow down with each state of flaps. Now this is quite interesting. Do you realize you're actually controlling the aircraft speed with a flap lever? Does the, do the aircraft system guide you when to select a different flap setting? No, they do not. You have to control it. So, why use selected speed? Well, you may be under speed control from ATC, or you may want to modify the speed for your own reasons. There could be a number of reasons. Here's a few. There's no way to describe all of the possible scenarios. Let me show you this example. Look at these turns. They look really sharp. Maybe you want a relatively lower speed to make them manageable. And what's this? Bad weather at the same time. Maybe the speed trend will be shooting up and down. In this case, you may want to slow down a bit early and get the aircraft at least partially configured. In this example, maybe slowing down to configuration 2 might, things, might make things more manageable. 
Let's compare managed and selected speed for this. In managed speed, once you have flaps 2, the aircraft will slow down to V approach speed, causing a fairly large shift in pitch and power. However, if you are in selected speed, config 2, say around 180 knots, the aircraft energy is quite comfortable and stable. Remember, combination of speed and configuration is an essence in your energy management. As we mentioned earlier, flying an Arnav approach is easy. Just press the approach push button and the aircraft will take care of the rest. As a conclusion of this chapter, I want you to think about your relationship with the aircraft systems. Indeed, they are very sophisticated and capable. However, they are limited in scope and they do not, cannot, take into account all the variables involved. It is your responsibility to be in control of the box and over at the guidelines if and when applicable. Be in control. Procedures is a pretty big term used for a lot of things. In this module, we will look at standard operating procedures for Arnav approaches as they are published in the Airbus FCOM. As procedures are typically described for different phases of flight, we will follow them in this order, from approach preparation during cruise to initial, intermediate and final approach. And last, we will examine sub some abnormal procedures as well. So, here we are, cruising along, top of the sun coming up, time to prepare the approach. There are a few tasks here presented in no particular order. Confirm the minimum equipment required and it is available. Check the ECAM and tack lock to confirm. Check the GPS prediction for your destination and your ETA. Are they Yankee or November? As always, check your destination weather. Is it too cold for Arnab? Crosswind limitations are the same as for a normal approach, but note that Q&H cannot be from a remote station because of the VNA function of the approach using parametric reference. The approach plate needs to be cross-checked with the MCTU and should be the same.
or almost. There is a small margin allowed in the vertical and lateral tag. Check your FCOM for details. After the vertical interception point, the MCTU should not state too steep path. If it does, the approach may not be used in final approach mode. Insert the runway threshold in the MCTU progress page. This will help you monitor your profile. Discuss how to fly the approach. Revise the FCOM or QRH for details of different approach guidance. But discuss it in a broad context. How do you want to manage the aircraft overall? and consider go-around strategies, specifically for degraded navigation. Loss of GPS primary is especially relevant for Arnav. Well done. Now we're all good for descent. Remember that during this phase of flight, Things can be quite fluid. ATC may alter your profile, which may affect sequence of events. Let's consider some principal SOPs. At 10,000 feet, check your MCTU for GPS primary and accuracy high. This is a prerequisite for Arnav approach. Also, cross check the altimeters. Due to the VNAV function of the approach, there's a limitation for altimeter discrepancy. Monitor the lateral track and cross-check with the approach profile. If under radar vectors, make sure that the vectoring from ATC is appropriate and does not cut you too short on final. You can extend the center line from the final approach fix for interception from heading or you can use the direct to function to intercept but with caution as the aircraft may not follow the assigned vector. Once you are cleared for the approach, you arm the approach by pressing the approach push button on the FCU. Confirm that you have appropriate modes armed or engaged on the FMA. Check that the deviation scale or scales are visible on the primary flight display. 
and the value of the indications. On the navigation display, confirm that the final descent point is indicated with a blue arrow. At this, st at this stage, you are all set for the final approach. Almost there. We are now at the final descent point. This is confirmed on the FMA with approach final engaged. You can now set the go around altitude. Your workload now depends on whether you have chosen to fly a decelerated or an early stabilized approach. Monitoring becomes one of primary tasks. Now you need to monitor the progress. Observe any cross-track error on the navigation display or if installed on the primary flight display. Vertical path is monitored on the vertical deviation scale on the primary flight display. You should also cross-check the distance versus altitude from the approach chart and compare it to the current altitude and distance from threshold that you have inserted in the MCTU progress page. Deviations should be called out Go around for excessive deviation. Check your FCOM for limitations. Congratulations, you are now at minima. If visual reference is met, you continue. If not, go around. There are many abnormalities that can affect an Arnav, an Arnav approach. What they have in common is the individual or combined effect on the navigational capability of the aircraft systems. Let's look at some basics. If you lose GPS primary and or you get a navigation accuracy downgrade. If this happens on one side, reverse to the other autopilot and flight director. If you lose GPS primary on both sides and or you get a navigation accuracy downgrade on both sides or you get an econ warning stating nav FM GPS position disagree Then, discontinue the approach.
if deviation, either from lateral track or the vertical path, becomes excessive, you discontinue the approach. For details on each aircraft and limitations, confirm with your FCOM. Now this concludes the academics, time to put theory into practice. In this final module, we will look at videos from seven different ARNAV approaches with LNAV, VNAV, Minima. Before each demonstration, there's a short briefing about what is going on in each set. Each one is edited to make it shorter and more concise. Your task is to observe as much as you can, try to abstract some of the things we have already learned, and enjoy. We are fully managed. Approach is armed, final blue, approach snap green, vertical deviation scale comes in. The aircraft creates an interesting altitude restriction at 3,294 feet. Which it combines with the deceleration point. Observe the blue arrow indicating final descent point. Just before the blue arrow, final approach mode is engaged and the aircraft starts final descent. Low now, on profile, speed is coming down to the approach. No. 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 
So, let's trap and drag. The set speed is selected. Passing the point, the little deviation comes in. Now pre-select the next altitude restriction. And as we pass, first idol, open descent. Blue arrow indicates level off at 2500 feet. Again, pre-select the next altitude. Then, over descent. Blue arrow indicates level off at 1800 feet. Approach is armed, final blue, approach nav green. Blue arrow indicates final descent point. Vertical deviation shows that we're low. Final approach mode engaged. And lateral deviation scale appears. The aircraft starts its descent.
approaches armed. Final blue approaches nav green. Blue arrow indicates final descent point. Approach is deselected. Blue is replaced with white. Vertical deviation indicates low. Crossing the white arrow, vertical deviation shifts from low to high. Heading is selected for vectors. Center line is extended. Now we turn inbound and descent. Vertical deviation centers. Approach is armed. Final and approach nav blue. Interception is indicated. Approach nav green. Blue arrow indicates final descent. Final approach is engaged. And the aircraft descends.
2,500. A lot of indications and arrows. Passing deceleration point, vertical deviation comes in. Heading selected for vectors. Blue arrow indicates level off at 2000 feet. Center line is extended. Final approach and approach nav blue. Turning inbound, interception is indicated. Snow green. Blue arrow indicates final descent. Final approach mode engaged. Aircraft descends.
descending now to 3,500 feet. Approach is armed. Approach not green. Final blow. It's final descent. Final approach mode is engaged. And aircraft descends and decelerates. Now for the same approach. Approach mode is armed. Final blue. Approach map green. But almost immediately, final approach mode is engaged. Blue arrow and tickets from descent. And at the same point, the aircraft is at uh, the approach speed. Passing the point, the aircraft is at.
in this case, observe everything for yourself. As the aircraft starts to turn and descend at the same time, observe the pitch and try to feel the energy of the aircraft. Now, the same thing, except in speed 180, compact 2, and gears down. Look at the difference in the pitch angle when the aircraft turns from final, and observe how quickly you can become stabilized by using this method. And now, for some final words and conclusions. Although performance-based navigation 
including Arnav, may seem simple enough, the concept has been overcomplicated by a jungle of abbreviations. It can be hard to find exactly what you need in the manuals. Arnav approaches, they come in all shapes and forms. Some give opportunity for good profiling and workload management, others less so. The aircraft is incredibly capable of planning and executing non-precision approaches. However, due to lack of exposure by most pilots, it can play tricks on your mental model. Different scenarios call for difference, differences in pilot input and adjustment. Be prepared to act accordingly. As a final statement, I offer this advice. Understand the theory behind the action. Know always where to find relevant information, which is not always obvious. Make conscious decisions on how you want to execute an approach. And finally, act, be in control of the aircraft, not the other way around. I offer you my sincere gratitude for participating in this research. Now please finish off by completing the survey attached in the original email. Thank you.